Hey guys, welcome back to another video. And I'm super pumped about this one because we're going to dive into all of that crazy Friday news and what it means for Chelsea. And I'm joined by Ben. I'm joined by Ben Jacobs, a senior reporter for CBS Sports. Uh, ben, thank you so much for joining me. You were really the one to break this news on Twitter as well. Great to see you, Ellie. Yeah, a number of journalists have been following the Chelsea takeover. And I suppose the advantage that CBS Sports have is that from the original four consortia and then the three that went through to the final stage, they all had American links. So we had a particularly unique perspective. But even by this Chelsea takeover standard so far of delays, mystery, uncertainty, big players from business, alliances between rival bidders in the earlier stages, even by all of that drama or saga, whatever word that you want to use, the Friday 24 hours added an extra level of chaos that I don't think any of us saw coming. I definitely didn't see it coming. I was out and I just happened to check Twitter and I was like, what is going on? So to recap, guys, if you have not for some reason <laughs> seen this news, Todd Bowley was named as the preferred bidder for Chelsea. What exactly does that mean, Ben? So a preferred bidder is effectively, in layman's terms, a selected group that is put through to the final stage in this case of a takeover for Chelsea Football Club and what it means is they become in effect the favourite to complete the deal and by becoming the preferred bidder they get various liberties that allow them to get from being the last group in the process to acquiring the football club. Now what makes things interesting in this case is that they are the preferred bidder in the process defined by Rain Group and endorsed by Chelsea Football Club. But then when Sir Jim Ratcliffe comes along with a 11th hour bid, if you like, he's not part of the formal process. So you can, in theory, have a preferred bidder who would expect to be the only one left, at least for a period of time until they have an opportunity to complete the deal. And in addition to that, a sort of rogue bidder outside of the process. And of course, if Sir Jim Ratcliffe had bid formally and been part of the process from start to finish, then Chelsea would have to make a decision as to whether they were going to have an extra stage and put two bids through or whether they were going to proceed with one. But instead, we've got this bizarre scenario where there's a preferred bidder from the official process, and that's Todd Bowley. And then there's a lurking suitor waiting to see what happens who is still effectively waiting and has no control over what happens with Todd Bowley and the preferred group, but is formally or informally, depending on which way you look at it or term it, still in the process. And that's what created such confusion over the last 24 hours. Number one, how can you have a preferred bidder and a new bid? Number two, how can you have a new bid that is not part of the formal process. And number three, have Chelsea taken the new bid seriously? And if so, is there one group? And is that Todd Bowley the favourite to complete the deal? Or are there two groups left in the Chelsea process? Uh, and in which case, are they going to be pitted against each other? Or is Bowley still likely to complete the deal? And where does that leave Jim Radcliffe? And why would he release such a bullish statement if he wasn't a serious contender? So these were the questions racing through everybody's head, particularly on Those Friday. Those were the questions we I have... had, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but we do have a little bit more clarity now, at least. But look, coming back to the preferred bidder, regardless of Sir Jim Ratcliffe, being preferred bidder allows Todd Bowley's group to agree a period of exclusivity to sign a purchase agreement. And if in that period of exclusivity they succeed in that, then the Jim Ratcliffe bid will be irrelevant. And the fact that Chelsea have named the Bowley group as the preferred bidder, working, of course, with Rain Group, means that they are prepared to sell the club to Todd Bowley, again, regardless of Sir Jim Ratcliffe. So there is some clarity there. But the next step for the Bowley group is, as they've done over the weekend and will early into next week, define exactly the length of the period of exclusivity, which is believed to be one week. And with Ratcliffe 
lurking, they will have some pressure and Chelsea will be able to speed along the process. But within the next five to seven days, the Bowley group will have that opportunity to exclusively talk to Chelsea and get from preferred bidder or in layman's terms, favourite to a purchase agreement. And then from that point, they will then have another couple of weeks to go through all of the box ticks of a takeover to fully complete the acquisition before May the 31st when Chelsea's special licence expire. And by box ticks, I mean passing the owners and directors test with the Premier League, which shouldn't be a problem. Having the new licence of sale signed off by the British government and transferring the funds. And obviously there needs to be some clarity as to exactly where those funds go because Roman Abramovich cannot receive them directly. And there also needs to be some kind of transparency over what specifically the donation will entail because we know from Roman Abramovich that the funds are going to quote the victims of the war in Ukraine. But what does that mean? Is it through a new charitable foundation? Is that foundation still defined by Abramovich, even though he can receive no benefit? Are Chelsea's current executives going to set that up? Or can the new ownership group have some say over that? And will there be any consultation with fan groups as well? So there's a few questions like that. But, you know, in essence, the roadmap from Bowley's perspective is exclusive talks. If they succeed, purchase agreement. After the purchase agreement, they pass the owners and directors test. They clear the sale with the government. They transfer the funds and then they take over the football club all in theory, before May the 31st, otherwise Chelsea's special license will expire. Interesting. And so kind of um, just to kind of bring that Jim Radcliffe angle. So I understand from what you said that really Todd Woolley is going forward. And if for whatever reason they can't reach an agreement, then that bid is still there. But it seems like Todd Woolley should in theory be the new owner of Chelsea Football Club is that more or less safe ish to say I think the Bowley bid would tell you that but obviously Rain Group and Chelsea specifically are under no obligation to sell to a preferred bidder I think given the need for speed Chelsea wouldn't be wasting their time entering into any period of exclusivity with a preferred bidder unless they were prepared to sell but if during the process there are any hurdles or if Chelsea are prepared to allow Ratcliffe to flesh out his bid and pitch it and they like that and they think it can be done equally as speedily, then absolutely they could turn to Ratcliffe. So if you want to really simplify it and look at it superficially, you would say that Bowley is in the box seat to take over Chelsea and Ratcliffe has come in with a late offer, an impressive one on paper, financially speaking, but it is a backup. And Chelsea are wasting their time entering into exclusivity with Bowley because at that point they can't progress things legally with Radcliffe. And mm -hmm. the period of exclusivity will only be short, but a week is still a long time in the context of how quickly Chelsea needs to be sold. So to mm -hmm. allow themselves a week with Bowley, if actually they would quite like to listen to Radcliffe, would be a bad move. Now, the only caveat to that is the terms of Rain Group's process versus the manner in which Radcliffe bid. And by that, I mean, exclusivity can come in theory, even though the Bowley Group won't like it, via the Rain process. And because Radcliffe has gone direct to Chelsea and has not entered the process, Chelsea may feel that they can listen to him, even though they cannot engage with him or progress it at the same time as doing all of their talks with the Bowley group, which means that if after, let's just say, a week, things haven't progressed with Bowley and a purchase agreement hasn't been signed, they at least won't have entirely had Ratcliffe just sitting and waiting. They can effectively empower him to flesh out the bid and be ready and have things on paper and have his group in order and even potentially forewarn the Premier League or the government or fan groups that they may be turning to him to elaborate upon his bid. And that will be his hope, ultimately, that due to the delays and due to back and forth over the value of the sale 
and due to questions over whether the numbers add up over the renovation of Stamford Bridge with all of the consortia, not just the Bowley Group over the last two weeks, Sir Jim Radcliffe saw a window having wanted to buy Chelsea originally in 2019, but been unable to agree a price with Roman Abramovich at that point. So now Radcliffe feels like he knows the club. He did some legwork behind what he'd do with it in 2019, albeit that's in the pre-COVID-19 era and also before all of these sanctions hit Roman Abramovich. So a lot has changed at Chelsea, but he'll certainly feel like he knew the football club relatively well and is in a position to swoop in. So it wouldn't at all surprise me if, from Bowley's point of view, he engages into exclusive talks with Chelsea and absolutely they see that as the most likely scenario and Bowley is now the big favourite to take over Chelsea Football Club. But what Chelsea don't want to do, having ruled out the other two suitors, is find that there's a late problem with the Bowley bid on either side. The deal doesn't happen or as quickly as Chelsea need it and then they've got nobody waiting. So that, I think, is why Chelsea haven't just dismissed the Ratcliffe bid because they know that he's serious and that the funding is there. And then they have somebody to turn to or use as leverage against Bowley to get the deal done as quickly as possible and at the value that they want. So at this stage, there shouldn't be actually that much negotiation. The back and forth predominantly should have already happened. But because Roman Abramovich wanted a bit more money given towards the charitable trust and because Ratcliffe has come in with a relatively healthy offer, financially speaking, Chelsea once again have got leverage and control over the situation. And I think that's why they're open to leaving Jim Ratcliffe almost hanging for a week to make sure that come what may, they've got two suitors in this race, one that's leading the race and is likely to buy Chelsea and another in case anything goes wrong. And that's my reading of the situation. But of course, it's fluid and a lot is going to change in the next seven days. But talking to the Bowley consortium and even the two failed suitors, the feeling really for the last 10 days has been that the Bowley group were always likely to be the preferred bidder and they continue to build the situation as nothing has changed. So now they expect just to smoothly go into the next stage next week, sign a purchase agreement. And if they sign that purchase agreement, there'll ultimately be nothing that Jim Ratcliffe can do. And Mm -hmm. if Chelsea ask Jim Ratcliffe to flesh out his bid, put it on paper, and they're impressed with that, they will effectively have to end exclusive talks with the Bowley group and move on to Ratcliffe. And not only is that very risky time-wise, but the Bowley group won't be coming back after that if they are removed from the process because Chelsea suddenly turned their attention to somebody else. Not only have Chelsea gambled on Ratcliffe, even though that bid is not as developed as the Bowley bid, but in addition to that, they've completely bypassed the process that they set up, and that's not a good look. And this sale is partially, at least, about optics. So Chelsea are actually in a very difficult position with Ratcliffe if a scenario did emerge where they wish to develop that bid because what they would be doing is saying to the other suitors, to Rain Group, to the government, to the Premier League and the fans, you needed an urgent sale, a fire sale. We set everything up, but then we decided at the last minute to abandon all of that and just go with a big offer that came in at the 11th hour. And you can and do that, not- like even though that the process was set up, because I was under the impression that you had to go through that process. And so that so that's why I was surprised that the bid, that the bid was even able to go through or come in, because I thought like, well, these are the bidders. This is it. Nobody else can enter agreements. I mean, the way that the process works is almost like a tender, which is traditionally associated with broadcast rights. So Chelsea outsourced the kind of filtering of suitors, albeit Bruce Buck had a big influence to Rain Group, and that's their decision. And then the terms of how the process will work, again, are dictated by Chelsea and Rain Group, but in light of the fact that everybody at Chelsea knew they needed a quick sale and the government have made it clear recently that Chelsea are on borrowed time and told them that much even as early as March and said this has to be done within a matter of weeks or 
at the most a couple of months when usually a takeover of this magnitude might take the best part of a year. So everything is happening at super speed. And the terms, if you entered into Rain's process, did have fixed deadlines, but it was also fluid in many respects. So after the first round, the failed suitors such as Saudi Media Group were encouraged to reinvest in successful consortiums and make alliances. And not so much with the Boley Group, but with the other two, the makeup of the consortiums changed a little bit. So there was some fluidity to allow new investment and faces with the Martin Broughton bid, for example, we all know about Lewis Hamilton and Serena Williams. They were late additions. Clear Lake Capital are obviously the majority investor in the Bowley Group, but that was always the plan. It just wasn't that known, but they've not actually changed their makeup at all. But the other consortia kind of chopped and changed their names and adapted to the situation. So there was some fluidity, but ultimately Chelsea decided that there was a process with deadlines. Now, that's not to say that legally someone can't come in, but if they are to come in, they can't enter the Rain Group process, which is why Sir Jim Ratcliffe has gone straight to Chelsea because it allows him to show his interest and then wait. And then if the process doesn't yield a successful owner for Chelsea, Chelsea can say, well, now we need to effectively start all over again. And we've had somebody come in and we're going to go in that direction, having completed our process and not found anybody. So mm -hmm. I think that's how they'll argue it. But the reason why there's so many grey lines is because sources always told most of the media, especially from Rain Group, that there was a fifth, quote, mystery bidder. And Rain Group sources made it clear that that mystery bidder never came to fruition. And that mystery bidder is effectively Sir Jim Ratcliffe. And what Sir Jim Ratcliffe did is considered bidding for Chelsea when Rain first put the sale to tender, if you like, expressed an interest in March, formulated a, for want of a better word, vague plan and then walked away and now has returned directly to Chelsea with a sort of spontaneous bid. And Rain Group sources have always maintained that that fifth mystery bidder never made it to the first offer or the final offer. But we were well aware as media that there was a fifth mystery bidder in the mix. But then when the final shortlist came out and originally there were only four on it, including the Ricketts group, the feeling was that mystery bidder had gone away. But now Sir Jim Ratcliffe is back and is kind of silently waited in the wings, seen how it's all played out, and then swooped in at the last minute. But I think if Chelsea had to go with Ratcliffe, they effectively have to argue that the Rain Group process officially was carried out openly, transparently, and according to the book, and it didn't yield a owner. So they would have to accept that as preferred bidder, the Bowley Group were unable to reach a deal, and then they would turn to Ratcliffe. Mm -hmm. When in fact, the more likely scenario is just that Bowley will complete the deal and Ratcliffe will have the situation out of his control unless Chelsea choose to go rogue, but the optics of that just wouldn't be good. Exactly. And I want to speak a bit about this Bully bid because I feel like he's always been the standout bidder uh, amongst the Chelsea fans. And from the reading that I've done, I really personally liked that he had done some interviews and he had tried to buy Chelsea. He couldn't but he really seems to have this mentality that the fans should be at the heart of the club and, and the way forward and to always keep your decision-making with them. So what are kind of the main building blocks of the bully bid uh, that make him such an attractive owner for Chelsea? Well, I think the first thing to say is they were three strong bids. And even though the Ricketts family offer that didn't quite make it to a final stage bid, even though they were on the shortlist, that was hugely unpopular. But again, if you just look at the tenets of the bid, it was also pretty strong. So Chelsea are sport for choice in many respects because they've had a number of very sustainable offers. And the reason that the Bowley bid stood out was for a number of reasons. Firstly, because they can finance it with capital up front, whereas the Broughton bid had to borrow a little bit of financing, I say little, very glibly because it was millions, but in the context of the takeover sale amount, a little bit of money via loans. And Paluka 
didn't really have a particularly clear or detailed roadmap for the development of Stamford Bridge, and his numbers didn't add up comparative to the other two consortiums. So the Bowley bid effectively was better on the redevelopment of Stamford Bridge and didn't have to borrow any money in order to finance the deal. But the other reason why it stood out was because of the mentality of the group. So with Paluka, it was very much about him. And of course, he had high profile investors, but Paluka wanted to come in and manage the football club and tie it up with Atalanta in a sort of city group mentality and very much kind of build an empire around Chelsea for, of course, the benefit of the football club, but also to kind of build a powerful player in world football, of which Chelsea's one part, but other football clubs are involved and non-football businesses are part. And therefore, when you have that business empire mentality, what it tells you is that Paluka is also looking to gain financially and brand-wise beyond just Chelsea. So Chelsea kind of migrates into Paluka's own business empire and mentality. And Chelsea were not necessarily against that, but specifics were just lacking. And then, as I said before, with Broughton, there was criticism over the celebritization of that bid. And certain sources that I've spoken to at Reign and at Chelsea weren't overly happy with the way in which they were trying to perhaps turn the sale into a popularity contest versus actually hard detail and ensuring that the numbers add up. But Bowley's not just the preferred bidder because of those factors. It isn't a case of other suitors had negative aspects and Bowley didn't. The Bowley bid won predominantly because of how strongly they pitched. And the difference between the Bowley bid and the other two is that there's no sort of ego behind it. So Todd Bowley is managing the pitch and will have operational control at Chelsea, but his original interest was based on the fact that he didn't want to buy the football club outright because he didn't see any value in that. So what did he do? He found initially a rival suitor in Hans-Jörg Weiss and partnered with him. And Weiss, again, isn't interested in any sort of glory or vanity on a personal level. He wants to kind of selflessly and quite quietly help manage the business side of Chelsea. And then Clear Lake Capital are going to have the majority stake. And Bear Dad, who is behind that, is a big football fan and is very hands-on. And then when they saw the brief from Rain Group and they knew that they had to quite rigidly target different areas to show how they would invest in the football club over a 10-year period, how they'd develop Stamford Bridge, how they'd integrate the academy into the first team to create more pathways, how they would grow the global brand, how they would evolve the already very successful Chelsea women's team, how they would promote diversity and inclusion. When they were asked on all these different things, instead of just providing a response, they delegated each area to experts and they integrated those experts into their bid. So now what you have is Clear Lake Capital as the controlling owner. Todd Bowley, who has a track record of redeveloping the Dodgers stadium recently, having operational and football control over Chelsea if they're successful. Hans Jörg Weiss looking after the business side. Johnny Goldstein leading on the development and going to Dave Hickey, the former project manager for Roman Abramovich, has abandoned or failed, whatever you want to call it, redevelopment of Stamford Bridge. So when Chelsea and Rain Group see that pitch, each area, they see a name who is not only an expert in that field, but they see a variety of people that have been delegated almost absolute control to get those aspects done. So they feel that that bid is a team effort and they're very impressed by the experts and they think that it is sustainable and they genuinely believe that each area being pitched can be realistically done because it's not a pitch from scratch. It's a pitch using people in each area that have succeeded before in whatever has been asked of them. So naturally, if you want to redevelop Stamford Bridge, it helps to have Dave Hickey on board as a consultant because he's worked with Roman Abramovich to put together a starting plan before. And 
Chelsea's new owners can learn from that. It helps to have Jonathan Goldstein because he has huge experience in the property area. So I sort of compare it a little bit, and Chelsea fans might raise their eyebrows at this, to Newcastle United. And I don't mean like for like in terms of ownership groups because they couldn't be more different. But if you look at the Newcastle United setup currently, you have Amanda Staverley, who is a minority owner like Todd Bowley will be, who speaks for the football club and effectively helps run it at the moment, at least on a day-to-day -day basis. You have Jamie Rubin, who is a minority owner, who is very hands-on and has a massive background in property. And then you have the public investment fund, who are the majority owner, who are a little bit more silent and distant, but are very much intent upon growing the brand. And at Chelsea, again, I think you'll have these divisions. I believe that they'll be a lot smoother than at Newcastle United. And I think that Clear Lake Capital will actually prove to be very vocal and transparent rather than entirely silent. But fundamentally, you're going to have at Chelsea a majority owner that's more intent upon commercialising the club and growing the brand. And then you're going to have a series of minority owners that have delegated roles with Bowley controlling the football side, with Vice having a smaller say perhaps on the football side, but fundamentally being a part of business decisions. And then you'll have Jonathan Goldstein involved on the redevelopment of Stamford Bridge. And what that means is instead of just having one owner who has ultimate say, a committee of owners and consultants and investors will be a part of ensuring that not only does everything in the pitch get done, but that Chelsea's new business plan is more sustainable. And as much as Chelsea fans love Roman Abramovich, and even though there was huge success as far as trophies are concerned, the business plan is not that sustainable. So what you're going to find with the new Chelsea owner, if it's the Todd Bowley group, is that they're actually more transparent and vocal than Abramovich, who didn't really engage with fan groups or say anything during his time at the football club. So he was adored by Chelsea fans. There was huge success, but he never really spoke publicly to media, to fans. And his business plan in the modern football era is not that sustainable. So the Bowley group believe that they'll get everything done that's being asked of them. They will be here to stay. They will engage with fans. We still need clarity over whether they're going to provide a golden share. It's certainly something that they've considered, but sources are quite coy on that. After they win, they may well reveal the answer to that. But whoever takes over Chelsea, but particularly the Bowley group, is going to be more sustainable than Roman Abramovich. And in the post-COVID era, I think that's not necessarily a sort of sexy aspect to hook fans, if you like, but the word sustainable is really, really important to any football club in the post-COVID era. And that's why I think if the Bowley bid is successful, it will be very good for Chelsea in the long term, because I just don't think Abramovich's business model, even if trophies kept coming, is sustainable. And I think that the Bowley one is. That, that you literally have linked me perfectly to the next question that I was going to ask, which is, uh, you know, you make a good point, the Roman Abramovich model of hire and fire managers, and then the new manager is left with this group of players that were all bought for very specific managers and teams, and now they have to try to come go, like make them work together and we're seeing that in this Chelsea side now you have Jorginho who's bought for sorry of Marcus Alonso who's from the Conte era you have Kai Havertz and Romelu Lukaku who just like doesn't plug into the team so I think that for from my perspective and correct me if I'm wrong like I would love to see Thomas Tuchel have like a long run as Chelsea manager because I think he's doing an incredible job and two to buy players that maybe aren't the flashiest of names but that are going to slide into the team and I I think that Liverpool really has this done they bought Luis Diaz he's off flying and they just they always find like the player that they need. And that's something that I feel like Chelsea haven't necessarily done in the past. They kind of buy these players and then they spend a lot of money on them and then they don't work and they're sitting on the bench making massive wages. So 
do you, what do you think it like is there any information available at this moment in time and i realized that perhaps it could be a little early about what's going to happen in the summer because obviously chelsea have a lot of contracts that are up um christensen is going to barcelona i'm fairly <laughs> fairly convinced Rudiger to Real Madrid. You have Jorginho, Marcus Alonso, Conte expiring next year as well. Uh, Aspilicueta, another one that is on the fence. So what do you see happening in the summer? Because I do feel that Chelsea have a lot of these players that are likely to leave and players that are aging and we really need reinforcements, especially in midfield and defense because the, the contracts are expiring. Yeah, it's a great point. And um, obviously the uncertainty of the new ownership group, particularly with Rudiger counted against Chelsea's ability to have him sign, even though he absolutely loves it at Chelsea um, playing with Thomas Tuchel. But unfortunately, he's also a big fan of Carlo Ancelotti and off he will go to Real Madrid and time just ticked away. And it's unfortunate, really, because Abramovich was not stupid here. And one of the reasons why in his initial statement before he confirmed that he was selling and the sanctions hit, one of the reasons why he was vaguer and the situation was unclear was because he absolutely foresaw the sanctions coming and was able through the football club to lay down certain offers, most notably to Rudiger and anything prior to the sanctions that was ongoing could have in theory been completed. So Chelsea were not actually in a position where it was impossible for them to sign various names. The offer for Rudiger just wasn't strong enough comparative to what he thought he could get and now will get at Real Madrid. And there was no real scope to negotiate from Chelsea's point of view, not because legally they couldn't, because again, that process had started, but just who's signing it off? Abramovich can't. Chelsea are not in a position where they want to lock various names in before they know what's happening. And they would, in essence, be spending a new owner's money without knowing who that new owner would be. And that was one of the real challenges. And ultimately, players don't know what the situation is. And until you know who's coming in and whether Thomas Tuchel is going to stay, he will. But what if you got a completely rogue owner in? What if a Saudi media group came in and said, actually, our plan is to try and grab Pep Guardiola? You just don't know. You can't foresee it. And with so many suitors, players feel uncertain about the situation. And that's been a big factor. And then, of course, there's just certain names that Chelsea didn't get round to starting negotiations with. The sanctions hit. And then they're in big, big trouble because they're scrambling just to pay their essential outgoings and needing government help. So the last thing they can do, unfortunately, is get player contracts signed. And that's why a new owner has to come in ASAP. But what I think you're going to see is the Bowley group try and bring stability on the football side. And their easy wins will be to try and nail in certain popular players onto long-term contracts and, as you alluded to, define what they're going to do with the slightly older players like N'Golo Kante. Very popular, but are Chelsea going to move him on? And by the way, if they are, then come back to Leicester, N'Golo. You would be very welcome any time because most players that you say are ageing might pass their peak at Chelsea at Kante's age, but Kante ultimately plays like he's an 18-year-old and probably will do so until he's 100. So okay. I don't think that if you're considering Kante, people should necessarily be looking at his age rather than the qualities that he brings and how much of a model professional footballer he is. But as you said, it's a bit too early to say, will the Bowley group create a transfer committee like Liverpool or how will they clear out the excess of names and what will their strategy be for recruitment. And I think that when we're talking about a strategy for recruitment, things will still continue at Chelsea as is when the new ownership group come in, at least for the next transfer window until the Bowley group see the lay of the land and determine what they want to do. But the broader point is that Chelsea and Manchester United in particular have operated very differently to a Liverpool, a Manchester City 
and even to a lesser degree in Arsenal, who are working quite effectively now with that relationship between Edu and Mikel Arteta. And Chelsea have overbought and Chelsea have over loaned out and Chelsea have always had rotational issues. And it always makes me laugh as a Leicester City fan because we, of course, had Claudio Ranieri, the tinker man, and he barely tinkered as Leicester won the Premier League. And thank you, of course, to Eden Hazard for his part in that. But it just the shows you. Stanford Bridge. <laughs> that was <laughs> epic. That was insane. Totally epic. We're nearly at the anniversary of that as well and the party at Jamie Vardy's house. But I think the point that I want to make is that when Ranieri came to Chelsea, he actually also had to do a clear out and he inherited a load of old players with relatively big egos and he brought in names. And then he was one of the first managers, I think, at Chelsea to realise how hard it was to balance a large squad and the number of egos, but also the huge array of talent. And that's the sort of hard part is that when tactically you're looking at different teams with different setups in a long season, it is sort of tempting to keep names that don't play that often, but you know can play a role in a certain game or you realise that you may get an injury or a fixture congestion or a COVID outbreak. And that's made it quite hard for a number of clubs. There's almost two aspects here. It's one, how do you balance a big squad and keep everyone happy? And every major club has that issue. And then two, how do you recruit for longevity? And if you're going to recruit for longevity, do you commit to a set way, a set style, a set manager? And that's where Abramovich's cutthroat approach, even though he's won so many trophies, has left certain players surplus to requirement. And that's where some younger players at Chelsea haven't seen as many pathways through to the first team because sometimes Chelsea perhaps have been guilty of bringing in a talent that they say they're going to be patient with and then wanting an immediate return and bringing in a star or two or a number of players in a certain position. And then that young player ends out on loan or unloved or lacking game time instead of maybe being thrown in a bit earlier and Chelsea having the faith that they'll learn quickly. And I think Abramovich has maybe, during his era, not wanted to take as many risks with younger players in the first team that Chelsea have bought and maybe been inclined to buy finished products. But then why have Chelsea got so many young players coming through academies, under-21s, under-23s, out on loan and so on? And in fairness, Paluka in his bid, made that exact point and said the whole point of having a sort of city football group or a Red Bull style group is instead of a young player coming to Chelsea and then being sent straight out on loan or coming to Chelsea and never playing any football or rarely playing any football and then finding that their career is impacted negatively. And it's cutthroat because you come to Chelsea with the promise of playing in the first team and winning trophies it doesn't work out and then see you later. And it's almost like you were never at Chelsea for a number of these young players and it can impact upon their football, but also their mental health as well. And in a group scenario, and Paluka, as I say, made this point, you don't have to say the promise is Chelsea. You have to just say, join our group. And then if it all ends well, you'll end up at Chelsea. But we've got other options for you within the group and Manchester City are very good at this as well. And there's certainly an appeal to a footballer about that when you try and recruit them because it allows you to feel more stable and you know that you might not just be at Chelsea, but Chelsea will always have the ability to sign you, but you'll go somewhere else first. And that's also what I like about the Salzburg and Leipzig scenario as well. So that is to some extent sensible, but I think that's too broad for Chelsea at the moment. And they've got too many players and too many targets to just transition to that and have those relationships with other clubs. So I think first and foremost, as you rightly say, and it's an excellent point, Chelsea just need to maybe move into that transfer committee model where Tuchel or whoever is in charge over the next few decades buys into this collective approach that says whether he stays or another manager comes in over however many years, there'll be a consistent approach to recruitment 
And there'll be mm -hmm. exceptions and there'll be times where the manager can just put down his or her foot. But there will be a consistent approach to what kind of player does Chelsea need? What type of personality? And at Liverpool, it's so much more simple than people realise. So I spoke to a source at Liverpool on the scouting team and he said that we actually only look for two things to begin with in a footballer. Number one, what's the first touch like? Number two, what's the reaction like when they lose the ball? And the reason for that is because they want to see how technical a player is and what their personality is like. And the reason why they want to know what the personality is like in a game and then ultimately in the dressing room and they speak to friends and family of that player, all the things you don't think about because when you try and sign a footballer, Chelsea fans will be like, well, how many goals are they going to score? Or what's their tackling like? Or yeah. how big are they? Or how strong are they? Or how fast are they? What's the positional sense like? But Liverpool don't look at that. Liverpool look for a fit and Chelsea don't. And the reason the fit is important is because that player might not play every week or they might have to adapt their game or a new manager might come in or the club might come under sanctions. And what a club like Liverpool need to know is, is that player going to have the ability to fit into that dressing room on and off the football field. And I think that in really simple terms, if Chelsea to, were to change one thing, they should be changing the approach of signing players that on paper work, but in their dressing room or on their football team don't gel as much. And if they can get better fits, then strategically over time, they'll have a stronger team because they'll have a stronger dressing room. Mm -hmm. A thousand percent. Um, good God, it's so much information. Thank you so much for your time, Ben. I know that we've gone way over what we initially had talked about, so I don't want to take any more of your time. But thank you so much for joining the channel. You gave such brilliant insight. I really, really, really appreciate it. And of course, I'm, I think everybody should know you from Twitter because you've been providing like incredible updates. But if not, let everybody know where they can find you. Yeah, you can find me at Jacobs Ben, not to be confused with Ben Jacobs, who is actually the Washington reporter, I believe, that was uh, tacked very famously and had his glasses broken, I believe, by a US senator. So he works for The Guardian doing news. And I'm obviously a sports journalist at CBS, but often I get tweeted about US politics and Trump by Americans because they think I'm the Guardian reporter and sometimes he no doubt gets asked questions about the Chelsea takeover but yeah I'm at Jacobs Ben and make sure that you also follow CBS Sports Galasso as well we're across the Chelsea takeover but if you're in America in particular we also cover the Champions League and Serie A and the NWSL as well so well worth keeping across all of our handles and our talent as well and please do reach out to me as well if you've got any thoughts or questions or comments i'm always happy to answer questions and engage with chelsea fans on this and always do my best in a very fluid situation to pass on as much information as i can awesome thank you so much ben i listen to the k Galasso podcast all the time so <laughs> highly highly recommend they do a ton of coverage i don't know how you produce so much content uh but it's incredible so guys thank you for watching this i hope that you enjoyed it and yeah if you have any questions direct them to me i can direct them to ben direct them to ben as well because i'm sure that we're going to have a lot more updates within the next week ish or so uh just to note we talked about this at the beginning we've recorded this on sunday may 1st at around 12 p.m because we know that the news is always is changing so this recording is at the time of uh we have so uh, i can't speak today <laughs> this is the amount of information that we have at the time of recording there we go so guys thank you for watching and yeah until next time i'm out bye